In this class, we shall deal with panuveitis. First, a quick recap of what is panuveitis. Classification of uveitis, this can be anatomically classified and clinically classified. In anatomic classification, uveitis can be either anterior uveitis, intermediate uveitis, posterior uveitis or panuveitis, depending upon which part of the uveal tissue is predominantly involved. Panuveitis is a condition where the entire uveal tract can be inflamed. So the primary site of inflammation is in the anterior chamber, iris, vitreous, retina and or choroid. So for the causes of uveitis, including panuveitis, we have a clinical classification of uveitis. It can be infectious, non-infectious or masquerade syndromes. So infectious causes could be bacterial, viral, fungal, parasitic or any other. Non-infectious causes could have known systemic associations or it could be only affecting the eye. And masquerade syndromes which appear like uveitis but are not could be neoplastic or non-neoplastic. The same classification holds true for causes of panuveitis. So the major causes for panuveitis are infectious or non-infectious. Non-infectious usually are immune related. So they can be classified under immune related causes. When we do not find either infectious or non-infectious cause for panuveitis, then the diagnosis would be idiopathic. But that is only after ruling out all other causes. Among the infectious causes of panuveitis, one should consider tuberculosis and syphilis. They are more common and they are in fact ruled out in every case of panuveitis. The other causes are Lyme disease and leptospirosis and finally infectious endophthalmitis. Infectious endophthalmitis will not be considered in this class. Another separate class will be taken for that. But one should consider tuberculosis syphilis in every case of panuveitis. Among the immune related causes, sarcoidosis is a major differential diagnosis. Others include Vogt Koyanagi Harada syndrome, sympathetic ophthalmitis, and Basset syndrome. Among this, VKH disease and sympathetic ophthalmitis are like sister diseases, one very much similar to the other. Sarcoidosis and tuberculosis actually present very similarly. So, these are the few common causes for panuveitis. Let us first start with sympathetic ophthalmia. It is also called as sympathetic ophthalmitis, sympathetic uveitis. It's a rare disorder, but it causes panuveitis and causes panuveitis in both eyes. It is actually an unfortunate sequence of events that follows penetrating injury in one eye and patient could lose vision in both eyes due to inflammation. So the definition actually is that it is a rare bilateral granulomatous panuveitis occurs after penetrating ocular trauma to one eye only. The injured eye is referred to as the exciting eye while the uninjured eye is the sympathizing eye. The exact cause is not known but what is theorized is that there is some sensitization that occurs to intraocular antigens and the body now mounts an immune response against the antigen in both the eyes. This results in bilateral ocular inflammation. So the penetrating injury is the precursor. This penetrating wound to the eye could occur surgically or non-surgically. Non-surgical trauma is more important risk factor than surgical trauma. Incarceration of uveal tissue in the wound predisposes to sympathetic ophthalmia more than if the wound was closed without incarceration of the tissue. In fact, the incidence of sympathetic ophthalmia is decreasing probably due to better wound closure with the present-day microsurgical techniques. When does this occur? In majority of cases, the presentation is between 2 weeks to 3 months after injury. Minimum of 2 weeks after injury, there will be no sympathetic ophthalmitis. The other eye is usually quiet. This time is required by the body for sensitization to occur. However, sympathetic ophthalmia can present even as late as 50 years after the initial injury. 
early signs of sympathetic ophthalmia is features of iridocyclitis in the fellow eye. The patient is usually being treated for the penetrating injury of one eye when he develops problems in the other eye. The prodromal symptoms in the sympathizing eye are photophobia, blurring to near objects, cyclitis affects accommodation, and redness. The early signs on slit lamp are the presence of keratic precipitates and retrolental cells and flare. So this involvement of the other eye when the injured eye is still inflamed should make one suspicious of sympathetic ophthalmitis. The established disease in both eyes appears like granulomatous iridocyclitis that is with mutton fat KPs and plastic iridocyclitis. The sequelae of this can be blinding. In the posterior segment, vitritis and multiple yellow-white nodules in the choroid. These are called dalen fuchs nodules histopathologically. They are nodules which are present actually just between the Brooks membrane and the retinal pigment epithelium and found in very few conditions. In fact, they are seen only in sympathetic ophthalmia, Vokkoyanagi Harada syndrome and probably sarcoidosis. The entire uveal tract appears thickened. Patient can have papillitis. It's a chronic disease with exacerbations. Ultimately, one could lose vision in both eyes. The only known way to prevent sympathetic ophthalmitis in the fellow eye is removal of the injured eye within two weeks of injury. Hence, all eyes with severe damage and no chance of recovery of vision following a penetrating trauma, one could consider enucleation as the therapy in order to prevent sympathetic ophthalmitis. Enucleation and not evisceration is the prophylaxis for sympathetic ophthalmia. But this should be done within two weeks of injury. Sometimes it is said that uh, enucleation of the exciting eye two weeks after the onset of sympathetic ophthalmia is also useful. It modifies the course of the sympathetic ophthalmia in the sympathizing eye. However, this is usually not done because it is not known at the end of the process which of the two eyes may have better vision. Mainstay of therapy for sympathetic ophthalmia is corticosteroids. Aggressive and by all possible routes of administration, topical, periocular, systemic. Antimetabolites and cyclosporine have also been used and sometimes are required early in the course of the day.